So good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all here this morning. Let's bow our heads together and come before our Lord. Father, as we come before you this morning, we're, we're grateful, Lord, that you provided this place for us to gather together, to worship you, praise you, and to study your word, Father. We pray for each of us that you would open us to your work, give us ears to hear, Lord, and eyes to see and understand just what it is you have for us, Lord. We love you. I ask that you bless this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You have done us in standing. We'll worship our Lord together.
upon your name. Keep my eyes above your head. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace.
for your, your richness, Lord, that you would gather us up with you in the clouds. And Lord, come quickly. We love you and ask your blessings again in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment. Say hi to someone. Well, good morning, everyone. That song never ceases to bless me. We, uh, we've been privileged once or twice to go out to Camp Pendleton, and they do the Armor of Light outreaches. And the Boots used to sing that song. And they sang it with an abandon that I have never heard anybody sing it with before. And so, you know, you can picture 800, you know, 18, 19, 20-year-old Marines and it's the first chance they've had to play music for, what, eight weeks? Well, a long time. A long time. Yeah. And, and so they get to sing These Are the Days of Elijah, and they would sing it at the top of their lungs. Oh. And, and, you know, there might be eight or 900 of them in the room. And, and then at the invitation, how many, what percentage would you say would come forward? 50% plus? 50% plus. Sometimes so hundreds as much as 80 of people. 90 percent? Yeah. And they would just sing that song with Amazing such thing. With abandon. Hand with hand, that's right. With I was teaching those to Michael in the back. Yeah. Um, you can YouTube it. Yeah, that's true. They have it on YouTube. That's right. That's right. It, it is very cool. Uh, great song. And these are, in fact, the days of Elijah, the dry bones becoming his flesh. So um, the Lord is coming soon. Of that, I have no doubt. No doubt whatsoever. So. Uh, we want to be ready, but we're, and this is part of being ready, is, is, is joining with other believers and worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth and learning his word and just kind of drawing closer to him, getting to know him a little better because you're going to spend a long time with him. <laughs> so if you want to know who you're hanging out with, this is, this is a good place to be. Um, I wanted to mention to you all in the way of an announcement that, uh, so I had talked to you guys about the prophecy conference at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, on September 11th. Uh, I went back the next day to register for the conference and it was already full. Cool. However, comma, uh, they are <laughs> offering a, uh, a pass, a video pass, so we will be able to stream it live. Uh, it only cost five bucks too, it was great. Um, so we're gonna probably end up streaming it live here uh, that day. So you can kind of come and go as you please. Um, you know, there are going to be some amazing teachers uh, speaking during this conference. And uh, it will excite you and energize you toward um, Bible prophecy in a way that maybe you haven't been in, in quite a long time. What's the date? Uh, I believe it's September 11th, but I, I, I could be wrong about that. I have to check the calendar to be sure. Um, if September 11th is a Saturday, then then um, that's probably the day. Uh, so anyway, put that kind of on your calendars and, and, and just keep that in the back of your minds. Who knows? Maybe we won't be here by then. Maybe we'll be gone because the rapture will have already happened and that would be okay by me. Uh, Michael, come on up. Almost forgot Michael. Michael is going to read Psalm 92 for us today. So if you would like to follow along, he will be in Psalm 92. Psalm 92, it is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness every night on an instrument of ten strings, on the lute and on the harp with harmonious sound. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O oh Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. 
But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord. For behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies. My ears hear my desire on the wicked, who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. Amazing. God's word is such a rich and inexhaustible treasure trove. Uh, now the worship team is going to play another song, and if the Lord puts it on your heart to support his work uh, through your tithes and offerings, uh, there is an agape box in the hallway. You can take advantage of that. God bless you. Shining down from above, I rely. 
for everything, Lord. We pray now that you would bless our time and our study. Open us to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. While the worship team is getting settled, I, I have a prayer request to bring to your uh, need, or your attention, I should say. Um, many of us know a fellow, he's a bass player, and uh, some of us have been able to worship with him as part of worship teams or as part of the fellowship that, that we were part of. And his name is Chuck, and Chuck just got put on hospice care. So he has uh, brain cancer. And uh, when you get put on hospice care, that's you know not a good long-term sign. So um, if you could keep Chuck and his family in your prayer, that would be great if you have a prayer list if you wouldn't mind adding them to it, that would be wonderful. Uh, in fact, uh, let's as a body lift Chuck and his family up to the Lord right now, shall we? Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you now just trusting and resting in your mercy and your grace. And thanking you, Lord, for your power and your majesty and your ability. And Lord, the way we can bring all our cares to you. Because you, Lord, care for us. And there isn't... A day in our lives that goes by where you don't care for us and think about us and and God we just ask you now on behalf of Chuck and his family Lord that you would shower him and his family with your tender mercies which are new every morning and God we just pray well we pray for a miracle Lord because you can do miracles you have that power and that capability we pray Lord that you would just do a mighty healing work in Chuck and just bring complete healing to him and we know, Lord, that that's not always your way and your will. So we just pray that whatever your will is, that it would be done in and through Chuck. Mm -hmm. and, and God, we just thank you for him. And we ask you to be merciful and gracious and kind unto him and to his family. And we pray for his family, Lord, that if there's any among them that hasn't yet come to a saving knowledge of Christ, Lord, that you would just remove the blinders from their eyes and help them, Lord, to recognize your reality and their need for you. And so we just pray now that you would move in this situation, Lord, and we thank you for our brother Chuck and just ask you to be merciful and gracious to him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So today we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3. And I got to tell you, this book, I, it never ceases to amaze me how Paul, the amazing things that God revealed to him, the amazing things that God showed him, the amazing timeless truths that God put upon his heart and that he wrote down and, and shared not only with the Ephesian church but with all of us as well. And, and this is just, Ephesians is such a rich book. It really is. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 3 today and we're going to go ahead and read that responsibly. If you are able and you would like to stand with me, that would be great. If you're not able to stand, that's okay too. But we're going to read responsibly in Ephesians chapter 3. I will read the first and the odd number of verses. You can read the even number of verses, and we will just so we don't have uh, a gaggle of speaking in tongues. We'll um, we'll go ahead and put the words up here on the on the screen, and it'd be Ephesians chapter three, beginning in verse one. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words. By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, and have partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who have blessed the least of all saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. 
according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And you may be seated. <clears throat> you might remember that at the end of chapter 2, Paul shared a glorious truth with us. Namely, that Jesus Christ has broken down the walls, which once divided people into two categories, Jews and Gentiles, and that he has made us all one in Christ. Now, we Gentiles who were once alienated uh, from God and from his promises have been made near through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can spend hours and days meditating on that and how wonderful it is. But we now share in the covenants and the promises that God gave to the nation of Israel because of Abraham. This glorious gospel of Jesus Christ is to the Gentiles. And we as Gentiles can share in the wonders of God's grace through Jesus Christ. We're brought in and made partakers of this covenant, these promises. That brings us to the doorstep of chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Now, to the untrained eye, it might appear that Paul penned this letter as a prisoner of Rome. But he gives us a different perspective of his situation as he writes. Yes, it's true, I'm a prisoner, but I'm a prisoner for a cause, the cause of Jesus Christ, and it's for you Gentiles. Think about it. The reason why Paul was persecuted, the reason why he was in prison, was because he insisted that the Gentiles could be saved by simply believing in Jesus Christ. As you might imagine, this did not sit well with the Jews, who felt that Gentiles could only be saved by becoming Jews. Thus, a Gentile could not be saved. Only Jews could be saved. That's what they believed. A Gentile had to become a Jew to be saved. Paul insisted that God was now offering salvation to the Gentiles. And this really riled the Jews up. Uh, they stirred up persecution everywhere that Paul went. And his imprisonment resulted from Paul's basic teaching that you Gentiles can have salvation too. Thus, verse 1 says that Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. He said, if I didn't pre preach this, then the persecution would cease. They wouldn't have anything against me anymore. But Paul stood by the message of God's grace that had been given to him. He said, I'm not Nero's prisoner. I'm not a prisoner of the Roman Empire. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And he has brought me to this place. Now, this will sound funny, but I'm kind of glad Paul was in prison. Because our Bible is a lot richer. And our body is more complete as a result of his imprisonment. It was while he was in prison that Paul wrote the letters that we value so highly. Not only that, but the guards to whom he was chained as a prisoner began getting saved. One by one, he had a captive audience. They were chained to him. Couldn't go anywhere, couldn't get away from him. But they were beginning to get saved one by one, and then returning to Caesar's palace, as born-again believers 
and spreading the gospel to those in Caesar's household. And that's why his, in his letter to the Philippians, Paul says, the saints in Caesar's palace, your new brothers in Christ, greet you. That's from Philippians chapter 4. Do you want to know the peace of God that passes all understanding? Do you want to be happy? Then you need to realize that wherever you are has been ordained by God to bring about good things. If only you'll have eyes to see and the patience to wait. Now, whenever I complain about my circumstances or my situation, I'm really complaining about my father. He's the one who sets our course and determines our days. Paul never lost this perspective, and that's why he could say, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for it is he who has captivated my heart and brought me to this place. He could see God working through his circumstances. Verse 2, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation or the stewardship of the grace of God which was given to me for you. So Paul is speaking of the divine plan and arrangement by which God had called him and sent him to the Gentiles. When you compare Paul to the other apostles, you see that his ministry was different and special. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 says, The gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me, as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter. Now, Paul and Peter carried the same message. They just carried it to different people in different categories. Paul went to the Gentiles and told them, You were far off, and now you can be brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's from Ephesians chapter 2. Peter went to his own people, Israel, and said, There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That's from Acts chapter 4. Paul told the Gentile Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. That's from uh, Acts chapter 16. So Peter and Paul carried the same message, though it was to two different groups of people. Now, Paul was telling the Ephesians, hey, there's, there's a brand new thing taking place. It's a different economy, a different dispensation from what you had in the Old Testament. Now, there are those who see eight different dispensations. And so I'd like to take a little time now to go through these dispensations with you. First, we have the dispensation of innocence. It began with the creation of man and lasted until man's fall. And it obliterates what you might call the mommy dearest syndrome. You see, Adam and Eve were perfectly healthy. They didn't have human parents. They didn't have a dysfunctional family. But what happened? They chose to rebel against God. The dispensation of innocence shows us that even if we had a perfect family situ situation, we're sinners who will rebel against God and wander away into our own error. So this nullifies the argument that the reason we're so messed up is because of our parents. Next, the dispensation of conscience. This lasted approximately 1,650 years from man's fall to the flood. People say, if we could just follow our own conscience and let everyone do his own thing, we could all live in harmony. But look what happened. During the dispensation in which God said, follow your conscience, the world was filled with such violence and sexual aberration that giants were produced on the earth. The planet was so perverted that only one man, Noah, was interested in walking righteously and responding to God. Genesis chapter 6 tells us so. The third dispensation was the dispensation of government, and it lasted about 425 years from the time of the flood to the time of the Tower of Babel. During this period, God established the first governmental order, which was based upon capital punishment. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 21. Man decided to add to God's order by undertaking the first governmental building project, the Tower of Babel. And like any other government building project, it didn't turn out so well. Genesis chapter 11 tells us that it was built with bricks and slime, a fitting description for the venture that ended in disaster. And after the dispensation of government came the dispensation of promise. 
This lasted about 430 years, from the time of Abraham to the Exodus. Man says, if I just had a promise, I know my life would be successful. I don't need God, I just need a vision. Abraham received such a promise, for God told him that his posterity would number as the sand on the seashore and the stars in the heavens, and that he would live in a new land. But what happened? His descendants ended up in Egypt, baking bricks in the blistering desert sun. Next, the dispensation of the law. This lasted about 1,500 years, from the Exodus to the cross of Calvary. There are those who think that if man just had some rules and regulations, he would be okay. So God gave man the law. Some think that if they could just find the right how-to book, that life would just make perfect sense. The law was wonderfully sensible and beautifully practical, but the only problem with the law is that man can't keep it. Now, the dispensation of grace is the dispensation in which we live and of which Paul writes. The dispensation of grace brings us to the place where we realize that neither innocence nor conscience, government nor promise, vision nor rules and regulations will save us. This, dispens this dispensation is God saying to us, I love you, I died for your sin. I rose again, if you confess your need for me with your mouth and believe on me in your heart, you'll be saved. Romans chapter 10 tells us so. Next, the dispensation of tribulation. That is spoken of in Revelation chapter 6 through 19. It will be a seven year period of unbelievable difficulty. You think things are bad now. I mean, people complain about believing in something they can't see or hear, so God says, oh, so you wanna see something. Well, you wanna hear something. Okay, here it comes. Angels are gonna fly across the skies. Hailstones are going to pelt the planet. Seas will turn to blood. Mountains ranges are going to disappear. Continents will break apart. And the results? Well, the majority of those who experience these cataclysmic changes will cry not to the rock of ages to save them, but to the mountains and rocks to fall upon them. That's in Revelation chapter 6. And last but not least, the dispensation of righteousness. Following the seven-year tribulation period, the Lord will come back to the earth. And he's going to rule and reign in Jerusalem for a thousand years. The lion will lie down with the lamb. There will be no more war. Disease will no longer ravage the planet. The environment will be perfect. People say, if only we didn't have pollution. If only we didn't have disease and crime, we'd be happy and content. But what's going to happen at the end of the millennial kingdom? There's going to be a rebellion against God. Of course, this totally disproves B.F. Skinner's theories that a good environment makes good people. For a thousand years, humanity is going to live in a perfect environment, and yet some will still rebel against God. An understanding of these dispensations will keep you from being confused by the way God deals differently throughout Scripture. For in the unfolding story of his progressive revelation. God shows us that man has no idea how to find satisfaction or success apart from him. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words. In chapter 1, Paul spoke of this mystery of God's will, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, God might gather together in one all things in Christ, both those in heaven and those on the earth, in scripture, the word mystery refers to something that was previously unknown or hidden, but is now revealed because the timing is right. The mystery of how Jews and Gentiles are heirs together is based on the dispensation of grace. As you read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, it will clear a lot of fog and remove a lot of confusion if you understand that essentially God is taking mankind on a march through the eight primary dispensations the ways in which he is related to us. There are those who say, we don't need God. We just need to get the right person in the White House. We don't need a spiritual revival. We just need a political revolution. Others say, if we could just get rid of all the toxic wastes and the pollutants, 
If we could make our environment better, if we could reverse global warming, we'd surely live in peace and harmony. And still others say, if my parents weren't so weird, I would be happy. <laughs> Worse yet, some say the problem is faith. We're being asked to believe in something that we can't see, can't hear, can't touch. If we could just see and touch and hear, then we'd believe whatever it is we're supposed to believe. So what does God do? He says, okay, human race, have it your way. I'm going to march you right through these different theories, these different ideas that you think will bring about happiness. And that's when the Lord began with the first dispensation. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. This open door for the Gentiles to receive salvation is something the Old Testament prophets did not foresee. The church age is something that the Old Testament prophets did not see. They, they felt that the coming of Christ would bring about the immediate kingdom of God. They figured that Messiah would immediately usher in the kingdom age. The Old Testament prophets didn't really see this age of grace when God would draw the body of Christ from among the Gentiles. And aren't you glad he did? They didn't really understand all that they saw or all that God had revealed to them. They wrote about things they didn't completely understand, but they wrote as the Holy Spirit inspired them. Thus, they themselves didn't know the things that they were writing about or their full significance. Isaiah spoke of the coming Messiah, how he would sit upon David's throne, order it and establish it in righteousness and judgment forever. And yet Isaiah also said that God's righteous servant would be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah also wrote that Jesus would be numbered with the transgressors. So he wrote of these things without fully understanding the apparent inconsistency of the things that he wrote. In prophesying the day that Messiah would come, Daniel declared that Messiah would be cut off and receive nothing of himself. The Jews will be dispersed. Even so, the mental attitude that Messiah would set up his kingdom was very prevalent, even among the disciples. They were constantly looking for the immediacy of God's kingdom. Now, after Jesus' resurrection, he promised that the Holy Spirit would come upon them in a few days. And they said, Lord, will this be the time when you restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this it, Lord? They never stopped looking for the kingdom to be immediately established. They didn't know that there would be this period of the dispensation of grace where God would be reaching out to the Gentiles to draw the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, from the world. It was to include Jews and Gentiles and make them one. The wall that had existed between them would be broken down, and they would all become one body in Christ. When Paul speaks of it as a mystery, he doesn't mean it in the same sense that we think of mysteries today, something difficult to solve. He means it as something that had not been revealed in the past, but that God was now revealing and making known. It's a new revelation from God, this place of Gentiles in the body of Christ, and how God was going to freely offer them the glorious promises of salvation eternal life and a place in the kingdom of God. Verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 3, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. The glorious mystery of God has been revealed. You Gentiles can have salvation, can have the promise of eternal life. You can have the hope of God's kingdom. You become a partaker in God's mercy and his goodness. God laid upon me the ministry, Paul said, of, bearing, of sharing this glorious mystery, God's grace to the Gentiles. Verse 7, 
of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Now, Paul was not a minister because of his piety, his spirituality, or his ability. The ministry of Paul's, the, I'm sorry, the means of Paul's ministry was singular, it was grace. That's what his ministry was all about. That was the foundation of it. Verse 8, to me who am less than the least of all the apostles of the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, Paul was aware that he was ministering not because he deserved to serve, but solely by grace. And the closer we get to the Lord, the more aware we become of the sin in our lives, the sin that was previously unnoticeable to us. The closer Paul walked with the Lord, the more amazed he was that God would use him. The least of all the apostles, 1 Corinthians 15. The least of all saints, Ephesians chapter 3. And the chief of sinners, 1 Timothy chapter 1. To minister the unsearchable riches of his grace. And take note that Paul did not talk about philosophy, psychology, or theology. The exclusive message of Paul's ministry was Jesus Christ and him crucified. Verse 9, and to make all people see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. All that God has done for us is by Jesus Christ. We've seen that clearly as we've gone through the first two chapters and on into the third here. Anything and everything that God has done for you, he has done in, through, and by Jesus Christ. These glorious mysteries which were hidden from the Old Testament prophets are now revealed through the New Testament prophets and apostles. They are those who testify of the marvelous riches of Christ that are available to all people. Verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold, which means variegated or many-sided, wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers or rulers in the heavenly places. In writing of these things, Peter said that there are things which angels desire to look into. Remember, God is omniscient. Angels are not. Angels do not know God's full purposes or plan. I imagine they have some pretty interesting sessions and discussions as they see God's purposes being unfolded. Now, the angels did have a, <clears throat> did have a better grasp of prophecy than man. When God would reveal things through the prophets, the angels did have a grasp of these things but not a full understanding. You see, they would have to see the working out of the plan for them to come to a full understanding. Peter also said, we have a more sure word of prophecy in 2 Peter chapter 1. Dr. Luke wrote, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. That's from Acts chapter 1. Now, I would think that it is very shocking and awesome to the angels that God decided to come and indwell man, that God would actually come and dwell within man. This is that glorious mystery, that God will actually indwell you by his spirit through Jesus Christ. My body can become the temple of the Holy Spirit, that Christ dwelling in me is the hope of glory. What a marvelous mystery. And watching this, you can almost hear the angels saying, can you believe that? God didn't reveal it to them except as it took place within the church. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The mystery reveals and furthers God's eternal purpose in Jesus as described in Ephesians chapter 1. That in the fullness of the times, God will gather together to sum up or to resolve all things in Jesus Christ. This was God's plan from the beginning. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. In chapter 1, it says that we have been accepted in the beloved. So God accepts us. Now chapter 3 tells us that we have access to God. And this must have blown their minds because that was something that was withheld even from the Jew. They did not have direct access to God. They had to approach God through the priest. He would enter into God's presence for them. When God gave the law to Moses, he told him, cordon off the mountain. Don't let anyone come close, lest they be destroyed. Moses went up and communed with God. And when the people saw the awesome phenomena of God's presence, they fled. 
They told Moses, you go up and talk to God. Then you can come down and tell us what he said. But we don't want to go near him. They saw the fire rolling across the ground, the thunder, all of those things. They didn't want a piece of that. They told Moses, you go up. We'll listen to you and we'll accept what you tell us that God says, but we don't want to approach all of that. And as God established the law, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies before God for the people. And he could only do that once a year, one day per year. But now we have direct access to God anytime we want. There's no longer a veil to keep you out, to separate you from God's very presence. As we've discussed, it was extremely significant that at Jesus' crucifixion, this veil was rent or torn in two from top to bottom. What was God saying? Through Jesus Christ, you can all come, for in him you have access to God. For what purpose? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, as Hebrews chapter 4 tells us. We were once alienated from God. We couldn't approach him, but now we've been brought close. We've been given direct access to God. And we should make bold use of that access. Some people still display timidity. They think, oh, I'm not really worthy to come to God. I'll just go to one of the saints and I'll ask him to go to God for me because surely he has access. However, that is unscriptural and wrong. When God opens the door and says, come on in, it's wrong for you to hold back. We should come boldly because we have access. Boldness and access. And we're made confident by the faith that's rooted and grounded in him. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul says, don't lose heart over my troubles. They're for you. What? How could that be? In his tribulation, in his confinement, Paul was a living demonstration of what it means to have Christ living in him, the hope of glory. A.W. Tozer rightly said, that before God can use a man greatly, he must allow him to be hurt deeply. Why? Because the old adage is true. People don't care how much we know until they know how much we care. What makes us care in our service to people, our interactions with people? Paul gives us the answer in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, in the, so our consolation or comfort also abounds through Christ. In other words, the degree of the crushing, the tribulation, the difficulty in which you find yourself will be the degree of consolation that you receive. Consolation comes to us so that we can in turn comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have found in him. And Paul had gone through much to bring them this message. It wasn't just an idle statement for him. He was the prisoner, beaten, scourged, buffeted, stoned. Don't lose heart at my tribulations, he said. It's all for your glory. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, so Paul was praying for them. This verse refers to his physical attitude of prayer, of bowing his knee. Now, there are many physical attitudes for prayer. When I come to God, it isn't the physical attitude that counts. It's the position of my heart. He who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, as Hebrews chapter 11 tells us. Some people have a hang-up in this area. They think that you're not really praying unless you're on your knees. But that's not a scriptural hang-up, it's just their own hang-up. Scripture talks about standing and lifting holy hands in prayer. It also mentions David lying with his face in the dirt, crying unto the Lord. And in a number of biblical scenes, people in prayer are lying prostrate before the Lord. Whether we're sitting, lying, kneeling, or standing, it's not what counts. What matters as you come to God is the position of your heart. I bow my knees to the Father. Prayer is to the Father. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's what John chapter 14 tells us. 
the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So Paul says, while I'm in prison, I'm praying for you, that the Holy Spirit might strengthen you in the inner man. Mom, Dad, do you care for your kids? Pray for them. Saint, do you care about your church? Pray for us. Do you care for your community? Pray that the Holy Spirit will work in the inner man. So many have knowledge in their heads, but it hasn't dropped 18 inches into their hearts. How does that happen? Through prayer. Paul says, I bow my knee and I pray. My prayer is that the knowledge of theology will make its way from your head to your heart. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. The Greek word that's translated dwell literally means settle down and be at home. Is Christ at home in your heart? Paul says, my prayer is that Christ will be comfortable in you. And where he's comfortable, where he's at home, you will be happy and blessed. Verse 17 continues, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Well, now that's an interesting request, isn't it? How can you know something that passes knowledge? How can you be filled with the fullness of God when God can't even be contained in the universe? And I suggest that the answer lies in that phrase, being rooted and grounded in love. What is rooted? What is grounded? What is love? The tree of Calvary was rooted. The cross was grounded. Therefore, the only way I can truly know the love that passes knowledge is by focusing my eyes upon the cross of Calvary and seeing what is the breath and the length, the depth, and the height of God's love. I see the breath of love, of his love, as Jesus stretched out his hand on the cross. To what lengths did he go? Because he was slain before the foundation of the world. His sufferings are stretched beyond anything we could ever comprehend. How deep did Jesus go? Listen, as he cried from the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cries out in the depths of despair, from the depth of hell, paying for our sin. What is the height of his love? Look up and see him on the cross. Pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The only way I can truly know that which passes knowledge is to consider the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of the cross, that which was rooted and grounded on a hill called Calvary. We're reminded of this every time we partake of the Lord's table in celebrating communion. At the Lord's table, you will know that which cannot be known. You will be filled with all of God's fullness. You'll be rooted and grounded in the mystery of God's love as you consider the cross. Paul realized that he had asked them some pretty tough things. So he says in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now I think that we often limit God by our own limitations. We carry our own limitations over into the spiritual realm. We're prone to place things into categories. Well, that's very easy. That's simple, no problem. Oh, that one's pretty tough. That one is, that one is difficult. And hey, that one over there, that's impossible. We tend to carry these things over to God, these limitations. Many times it even reflects in our attitude of prayer. Lord, this is a simple thing. You can handle this one. Or, Lord, this is, this is really tough. I, I don't know. Oh, forget it, Lord. It's impossible. We're prone to carry the human feelings that we have concerning situations over to God. But how many times has God done things that I thought were totally impossible, things that I had given up on? People that I had said, hey, no way. God says, what, is he, what does he do? He turns around and he saves them. And I can't believe it. Jonathan woke up one morning, his mind considering an interesting thought. I wonder if God wants to deliver the Philistines to Israel today. And if he does, then he doesn't need a whole army. 
If God wants to do it, he could deliver them into the hands of one man just as easy, easily as he could to the whole army. I wonder if he wants to deliver them today. And he had this crazy thought running through his brain. He couldn't get it out of his head. So he wakes up his armor bearer and he says, I'm having a crazy thought. I was thinking if God wants to deliver the Philistines to Israel, he doesn't need the whole army. He is, after all, God. He could deliver the Philistines to Israel by just one person. And he can do that as easily as he would to a large army. Let's go over and see if God wants to deliver the Philistines this morning. No, I love it. Let's go see what God wants to do. Let's venture out in faith. Who knows what God might want to do? He doesn't need a whole army. But we often measure things by our own abilities, don't we? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. We're intimidated by certain diseases or illnesses because man has diagnosed them as incurable. So we have a different prayer for leukemia than we do for headaches. Lord, he's got a headache. Relieve him, Lord. Help him to really be able to function today. Thank you, Lord. No problem. If God doesn't come through, take some aspirin. But leukemia? Leukemia? No. Oh, Lord, help. Man, leukemia, you've really got to pray for that. You have to get worked up on that one. That's really tough. Hey, it's no more difficult for God to heal leukemia than it is for him to heal a common cold. God doesn't have these categories of difficult, easy, or impossible. They don't exist with God. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly, and we need to remember this when we pray. When it comes to prayer, we need to be freed from our human limitations, this idea of difficulty. Paul prayed with confidence that God is able. We need to have such confidence when we pray. Verse 20 continues, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, amen. Now Paul, here at the end of chapter three, he tacks on a, this beautiful little benediction. Glory in the church by Christ Jesus, throughout all ages, world without end. And so shall it be, so shall it be. World without end, we will bring glory and praise to God because of the grace that he has toward us through Jesus Christ. What begins here will continue to a greater degree in heaven, for heaven won't be that much different than when we experience his glory here on earth in times of adoration, times of communion, times of meaningful interaction, and times of heartfelt intercession. A person who is truly walking in the spirit might not immediately realize they're in heaven when they finally get there because they'll just continue worshiping, rejoicing, and experiencing the Lord as they did on earth, minus the constraints of time, limited energy, and ever-present flesh. And oh, what a happy day that will be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we look forward to that day when we will see you face to face. How awesome it is to consider the breadth, the depth, the height, the length of your love for us. It is impossible for us to fully appreciate. It is impossible for us to fully comprehend all the questions and the doubts and the concerns that we might harbor will be answered with one gaze in your direction on that day when we finally see you face to face. And oh, how we look for that day, Lord. How we cry out from the, uh, the pit that this world is, that this world has become. This world that you started in perfection and beauty, but which we have corrupted. Father, hear our cry, hear our prayer. Make us aware of your love for us. Help us to understand it. Help us to apply it. Help us to recognize that you are not limited by the constraints that limit us. Help us to come boldly to find help from you in time of need. And let us seek help from no other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And oh, how we love you and celebrate you this day. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
which he has shown you, that which he has revealed to you, and share it with the people around you. I guarantee you. In fact, I'm going to pray that he brings somebody across your path this week who does not know him. Might even be kind of scary to you. But I'm going to pray that he brings him across your path anyway, and that you will faithfully and well share that which he has revealed to you and that he will, that God will just overcome your natural fear and your worry, and that he will just cause your faith and your trust in him to abound, and that you will, that you would allow him to guide your words and the ways in which you minister to the people around you. So may he just bless you with a beautiful week. May he pour out his spirit upon you. May he cause you to just abound in his goodness and his grace, and his mercy, and his truth. Don't forget to keep Chuck and his family in prayer if you, if you think about him this week, if God puts him on your heart. Uh, otherwise, you guys have a great week, and we love you. <laughs>
The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. May God richly bless you. Amen.